House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Okay, welcome back into the House of Mystery, and I'm Al Warren. Of course, you know that. And uh, on the other side of the country, we have Mr. David Rose Martino. <laughs> the man of a thousand names. You see, yeah, but the serial yeah. killer name works for you. You know, yes, it three, does. three names is perfect. Three names, yes. Three, it's just perfect. So, did you get that Beatles documentary watched yet? No, not yet. Come on, it's only eight hours, and I hear you got to get hours. Of you got to get that. You have to get that reviewed. NBC wants it up now. Now. Yeah, and you see, because they've got the director's cut coming out, which is sixteen hours long. And, of course, I'm recommending to them that you do both of those. Oh, so, I see. So you've got, uh, what, 24 hours of 24. <laughs> Beatles uh, documentary to watch and review. So, yeah. I better get going. I, I'm laying the workload on you now. Oh, man. Man. Well, somebody's got to do it. Yeah, I mean, you're sitting around the basement drinking anyway, right? So, That's true. I'm tired. I mean, down here. Yeah. Well, what difference does it make then? Yeah. What else have you got to do? Not, nothing. You know, hang out with the cat? Hang out with the cat. That's it. That's all I do. All yeah, I know. I know. It must be nice. <laughs> nice to be nice being the arm candy of a rich lady. I'll yeah, tell that's you. true. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> um, I've got I guess, my secrets, Al. I guess so. i got to get someone to write a book about this. Um, <laughs> okay. Now, today we continue. This week we're, we've been doing uh, all sorts of interesting interviews, and a lot of it kind of sleuth, crime fiction, mystery, a little bit of thriller, a little bit of everything in there. And we've got another one for you today. Now, uh, the book we're featuring is called Art of Betrayal, and it's a Kate Hamilton mystery. And the author is our guest, Connie Berry. So thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. And I guess if you're on the West Coast and uh, Dave is on the East Coast, I'm in the middle. Well, there you go. I, yeah, yeah. I'm in uh, Dave's a Boston guy. You know. Oh, okay. Yeah. He's one of those classy. He's a classy. He's a. Oh, yeah. He's a classy guy from Boston. <laughs> you know, you never know it. He doesn't have the accent, but. You know. Boston. <laughs> so, 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 Connie, this is interesting. Um, now it looks like to me in your in your history, you've got four books out now. I I well actually my fourth one is coming out May tenth. Okay, so you've got three books out. So that even kind of adds to it more. Um, what changed in your life to where you decided you were going to write books? And not only write books, but actually publish them. Yeah, I think writing and publishing are two different decisions because I've actually written all my life. Uh, right. I, you know, I, most mystery writers or most writers, I think, will tell you that they wrote as children, and I certainly did. I wrote stories as children, and because I had a mother who kept everything, I still have them. And um, so they're kind of fun to read. Actually, interestingly, almost all of them have some kind of mystery in them, certainly no dead bodies, but some kind of a, a, a mysterious thing that, that has to be solved. And um, so I've always written. I've done a lot of nonfiction writing as well for business um, and in and, and academics. Um, so I've always written. I started writing my first book. I'm almost embarrassed to say this, about 12 years ago now. But I was really just kind of playing around with it um, because I was working full time. And so I would work on, on it in the weekends and in the summertime. And um, finally, I retired. Um, and I decided now or never. So that was the decision to be published. Yeah, you know, you, you, it is. But uh, it takes a lot of courage, I think, you know, because I'm, I'm also a person that started getting published later in my life, like not as a teenager or in yeah. my 20s. So, um but it takes a lot of courage because when you put that out there, when you're actually okay. sending manuscripts out, quite often you get rejected. And also once it comes out, however you publish it, then you've got to deal with other writers and people that read it. And nowadays it's worse than ever because social media is oh, crazy. I know. Yeah. So that's really a lot of stress. So I think it's a lot of courage to actually put your, your feelings, your thoughts, and put your book out there. Yeah, and, you're right. 
you know so so, so i'm i'm always curious on that point itself on was there something in particular that gave you the strength so to speak or was there something that all of a sudden you thought oh the hell with it i'm doing it i don't care you know um i don't have a common story because a lot of people have a lot of rejection stories and i don't but that's only because i was too afraid to put my book out there i i have a very high taste in reading um i have a master's in english and i've read a lot of good books and so I knew my book was not ready. I didn't always know why it wasn't ready, but I knew early on that it was not ready, and so I did not risk putting it out there. And finally, and and I had had people read it, other authors, and I, you know, gotten some comments. Um, and finally, when I did decide to go for it, I decided to actually take the advice I'd been given, which I didn't really want, but. I knew that it was the right thing, and so I, I did a massive revision in 2018, and I actually ended that in January. And at that point, I decided uh, this may not still be ready, but I think I've done every single thing that I know to do at this point. And I, and I went to a conference, writer's conference, and you could pay $20 to have an agent or an editor read your book, your, the first chapter of your book. And so I did that, and uh, the editor was the editor I have now at Crooked Lane Books, and she loved the book, loved the series, and gave me a contract. So I don't have all those rejections, but only because I was afraid. And it's, you know, I, I always think of it, as, you know, it's a little bit like watching your your firstborn go off to school, and that school bus kind of goes down the street and then turns, and you can't see it anymore, and, and you have no control over what happens to your child after that, and that's kind of the way you, you feel with a book, that you, you've done the best you can, and you put it out there, and then it's for the world to decide. Uh, you know, your English, I, I, w I won't have you read any of my books then. <laughs> uh, <laughs> be grating. But isn't that, you know, because I find that, um, now if I compare this, I have my master's in music, so mm -hmm. when I listen to songs a lot of times I'm very analytical. I'm very, mm -hmm. I think of things on a technical side, and yet I can still enjoy the melody, let's yeah. say. Um, so I wonder if maybe that, is that sort of your kind of connection, being an English major, a master's? Or I would think that you would be analytical of everything you read. You know, that's true. I, I never can actually read a book again um, just to read. I'm, I'm a, a part of my brain is always, you know, using the red pencil or thinking, oh, that's wonderful, you know, golly, I, I wish I could – you know, have thought of something like that. So I'm always evaluating. But that that's part of learning as a writer. Um, reading is so essential. And reading not only in your own genre, but kind of reading outside of your genre as well, which is a little hard for me to do because I I read so much British detective fiction. I, I need to break out. But, yeah, and but that melody thing that you talked about, it's very possible for a book to have, something in that book that carries you through, maybe the plot, maybe the characters, maybe the setting, like that melody that you like, and yet you can still see where there are some ways that, that the book could have been better. And looking back at my own work, I can look back now and, you know, I wish I had a chance to revise and rewrite. You know, I, I'm a serial reviser, and I, I used to tell people I would, like, follow people home from the bookstore with a red pencil you know, making last-minute revisions. I, I would continue making revisions until somebody tells me, I'm sorry, you have to stop. And that's basically what my editor tells me. <laughs> stop following me home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you feel that uh, your master's in English, do you, do you feel it's made you a better writer, or do, do you feel that it gets in the way when you're trying to write uh, popular genre fiction? Oh, I think it. It, it helps. Um, I I know how to write a sentence. Um, I know uh, where to put the important parts of the sentence. I I know um, grammar. 
I mean, it's kind of interesting when when you read um, some writing, you know, people need a little help in that area. But, um, you know, that was never my problem. Actually, my my learning curve was not the writing of the words or the sentences or the paragraphs. Mine was learning how to structure the story. And that's what I did not know. And it's kind of interesting because I had read so much detective fiction and I, and, and, and I knew what made a good book, but for some reason I, I didn't get it into my head how to translate that onto the page with my own book. And that took me a while. Yeah. Yeah, it can. It can. It's a strange, it's a strange part of writing. Yeah. Um, sometimes you can see something and, and understand it or see something that you you really enjoy, and yet you can't reproduce it yourself. Yeah. Or you, you have problems with it, you know. Yeah. I'm just, I mean. Who is it? I, Ira Glass, I think, and, and This American Life talked about that, and I, it was really stunning to me that he's, he, he's talked about that gap between your taste in literature and your ability to write, and that as you continue to grow as a writer, your ability – hopefully reaches or reaches toward your taste. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's not always about your, I guess your, um, how much of the theory, you know, behind English or English lit, because um, it's just like in music, there's some people that can, can play or create something very nice, very good and have very little to no training. So sometimes there's a, I think the story itself has to be a very important part of it. And there's also um, a, an ear, like in music. Some people have an ear for music and an ear for melody. And I think some people have an ear for language. And language can be kind of musical. There's a rhythm to it. And, um, and when you write, in such a way that the reader doesn't have to stop. It's not jerky. It's not, it, it just continues to flow because you structured that. There is almost a musical quality, a cadence to it. And I've, I've always loved that aspect of writing and that aspect of words. Well, I'm wondering how you overcame um, any structural problems. Did you study plot? Is that how you uh, were able to uh, then then structure your books correctly? You know, it, it, it was a long process. Um, part of it was uh, just getting some books on story structure. I, I, I remember I had a friend early on who was a writer. She's now um, deceased, but she spent a little time with me one summer, and she said, I think we need to talk about story structure. And I go, oh, no. <laughs> you know, it just sounded so boring to me, but then I realized that that's what I needed, and so I got some books on story structure, and I started looking at different models, and I think one of the reasons I didn't like it was because I didn't want to write to a formula. And to me, writing to a structure was kind of like writing to a formula, but but I realized eventually that it really isn't because you can vary the structure, but if you know the structure, then you can vary it. But, but you have to know what, what a story is, what, what people instinctively want in a story. And um, so I think it was Donald Moss who said, you know, the, the cat sat on a mat isn't a story. The cat sat on the dog's mat is a story. Hmm. That there, there has to be some conflict. There, there has to be turning points. There has to be low points. There, there has to be new information that comes in, and it's it's how you pace all that that eventually makes a story. I also went to a lot of writers' conferences, and I sat in on a lot of sessions, and I I just listened, and I tried to. Every time I thought I learned something, I tried to put this into practice in this big, huge, massive starter book that eventually was published, but it took me so long. Um, and, you know, eventually, I'm not saying that I still don't have a lot to learn, but but I have learned a lot about structure and about how to tell a story. Yeah, and I think that when you, like when you said earlier, when you like to go back and revise, I think a lot of us do. I think every time you go back and look at an older book, you go, oh, geez. And I think that comes with the progression. You become a better writer. 
you know, each time yeah. you do a book and each time you go by. So you can go back and go, oh, geez, oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, I do that all the time. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, I just, that's me. Um, now, Art of Betrayal. Yeah. It's a Kate, Kate Hamilton mystery. So, so tell us a little bit, like, who is Kate Hamilton? Uh, well, the Kate Hamilton mysteries are set in the UK. Um, Kate is an American antique dealer. She is a, a youngish widow. She's either 45 or 46, depending on when her birthday is. I haven't given her one yet. Um, she, um, she was married to a Scottish man who emigrated and became a professor of law at Case Western Reserve University in Ohio. Um, he died tragically. Um, and uh, her daughter, Christine, is a second-year student at Magdalen College at Oxford University, so she has ties with with the U.K., and um, so that's kind of the basis for the story. In The Art of a Trail, she is in the Suffolk village of Long Barston, and she is running her friend's antiquity shop while he recuperates from hip replacement surgery, and she is thrilled when a local reclusive woman brings in an ancient Chinese funereal jar, very rare, uh, for consignment. She's especially excited because the woman implies she might be willing to let the shop handle her deceased husband's entire art collection. Ivor needs the business. Um, he loves buying a lot more than he likes selling, which is a lot like my father. Um, his bank account has barely enough to cover the expenses for that month, and so things are going well, except in the middle of the village Mayfair, the woman turns up dead. The police discover that she was stabbed in Ivor's shop, and the ancient Chinese jar is missing. So now, Ivor Tweedy may be ruined, his reputation. Um mm. So this is where Detective Inspector Tom Mallory comes in, Kate's friend. He is doing the police thing, and he's looking for the victim's missing daughter. At the same time, uh, Kate begins to notice puzzling connections with a well-known local legend of the Green Maiden. And uh, actually, this time, Kate is working with the police. They, they hire her to appraise the dead woman's art collection and find out if anything else is missing from it. So... That's kind of the premise of the story. So when you create, like, so you've got two kind of main characters in the story, you know, of mm -hmm. course, Kate, Kate Hamilton and, and, and Tom Mallory. Um, where did you get Kate Hamilton from? Like, where does that character come from? Is that you, or is it someone you'd like to be, or is it uh, someone you know? Like, uh, we want the dirt on this. Okay, well, um, <laughs> you know, some people think Kate is me, especially when they know that we share a lot in common. Um, Kate grew up in the high-end antiques trade, and I did as well. Um, her her father was the one who taught her about antiques. My father was basically the one who taught me about antiques as well. And so much so that I went to a speaking engagement one time, and because Kate is a widow, the person interviewing me assumed that I was a widow as well, which I'm not. My husband is... Um, very well, but I think Kate is kind of an alter ego for me. Um, we do have a lot in common, but we have a lot not in common. She's younger than I am. She's taller than I am. Um, she has some gifts. She has some deficits that I don't have, but because I don't really connect myself with her on a personal basis, I can be a little more dispassionate with her. I can make things difficult for her. I can um, I can have her uh, do actually whatever I want. And that's kind of fun because life isn't like that. I, I can't control my own life, but I can control Kate's. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe we should see, is your husband with you? Can we see that he's alive, that he's okay? <laughs> Proof of life. Well, if he Proof comes barging in, you'll, you'll know, or if the dog starts barking. But, uh, yeah. You know, maybe, maybe he's really a representative. No, I, I just, uh, okay, so, so how do you describe your relationship with, with Kate and with your characters, your main characters in all of your books? And I ask that because um, when we talk to a lot of fiction writers, they give me different explanations of 
who their characters are. And they'll say it's like my family or it's like my children. They're like, mm. they always can, can describe them in that sort of, uh, that, that kind of a manner. And I, and I always find that curious. So do you have the same sort of relationship with your characters? No, I actually don't. Now I'm beginning to wonder if I should. But, <laughs> but I don't. I, I don't think of them in that personal way. Um, they are people that I have created. And they're not based on any particular person, but I, I have taken parts of people that I know, um, elements in, in someone's personality that I have really admired and liked, and I've put that into one of the characters, but I've also perhaps added in some things that I, that I have seen that I don't like so well, um, or maybe not seen personally, but seen in characters in a movie or, or in a book. It's just that, that I have like all kinds of, you know, almost an unlimited source of material for creating characters. And each one is created um, specifically, and, and, and I try to even give them kind of a distinctive way of speaking. And that's um, not too hard when it's the U.K., because much like the U.S., people even from short distances away, less than 100 miles, will speak slightly differently. So that's been kind of fun to research that as well. And then also depending on where they are in society, the, the posh people, you know, will speak in a certain way and the, the uh, regular middle class people or class people might speak in a different way. So I think they're just all amalgams, but I really like all my characters. And, and some of the characters that I've liked the best are um, the bad guys or the bad girls. <laughs> well, you were you were talking earlier, um, and, and you were just talking right now about um, you know, distinctive voices, and and uh, we're talking about um, basically having an ear for language, mm. uh, which I totally agree with. And I was just wondering, you know, when you write, uh, Kate and Tom, can can you hear the characters in your head? I, I know I hear voices. <laughs> oh, do you <laughs> really? I, oh, that, dear. Yeah. He's, okay. he's I, insane. I'm insane, but. <laughs> I don't literally hear them in my head. I don't think you probably do either, but but I think I know what what you mean. Um, I I tend to visualize things a lot. I mm. I write scenes like a scene in a movie, and I I see it. I I see the expressions on their faces. I hear the tone in their voice. That's really hard mm. to um, to put on the page because you can't put the tone of someone's speech, mm. you, you have to indicate it some other way by um, either how clipped they are or how fulsome they are in their speech or, or maybe by cues in their body language, um, in their facial expressions. But that is really fun for me. I Writing for me, it doesn't come easily. Um, I it, It's very difficult for me to put words on a blank page. But once I have words on the page, even if they're awful, then I really start to have fun because I love that process of revision. That's where a book comes to be. Shaping, um, paring it down, um, thinking about the details, how many are necessary, how many are too many. Um, just all that kind of thing is just so much fun for me. So right now I'm working on the fifth book in the series, and it's really hard work because I, I'm just – you know, every day I'm, I'm putting new, new words on the page. Uh, so when you're doing this series, now, is each book going to stand alone or are you going to have to kind of read them all? You know, I've been very pleased with some of the reviews that I've gotten where people have said um, this reads as a standalone. And, and I think what that means is that you don't have to have read any previous book in order to understand the current book totally. But there are some aspects, the, the series arcs, the, the relationship between Tom and Kate, for example. Uh, some of the other characters have arcs that span different books. So I always try to start with the first book in a series, and I would love for people to do that. But it's definitely not necessary. Right, right. Well, listen, you you pick up things about a character that you've missed in the, in the past and mm -hmm. stuff. So yeah, I think it's important. You know, um, do you do you put like um, under under the story itself? So when we look through, 
you know, this particular story in Art of Betrayal. Um, but underneath that, is there kind of a subtext or kind of something that you hope uh, people pick up? Well, uh, yeah, the, I, I love history. I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about history. And I think it's a perfect job for Kate to have to be an antiques dealer because the objects that she deals with every day are old objects and they are objects from the past. And each one of them has, has a history, it has a story behind it that she might not know. But parts of it she may know, and that um, the uncovering of the past, understanding how the past is prelude for the present, um, looking at individual characters and their past, how how they deal with it, how they overcome it, perhaps, and that's kind of where Kate comes in. Kate has a kind of a tragic past, actually. She um, she lost three very important men in her life. Uh, uh, one was her Down syndrome brother, who was 11 years old when he died of uh, congen- congenital heart disease. Not unexpected by her parents, but no one had ever prepared her for that. She was only five, so she lost him. Then when she was 17, um, her father, wh- whom she loved dearly, uh, died in a car crash on New Year's Eve, uh, Christmas Eve. And then her husband, um, who had heart problems, who was a little bit older than she, but he never told her that he was having heart issues. He was scheduled to have some tests, but he never got to it, so he died suddenly. And so all of these losses in her life came when she was absolutely unprepared for them. And that has made her uh, very fearful of commitment, very fearful of loving someone, enough so that it would hurt that badly if they were to to leave or to die and so that that's part of her overarching character arc learning how to deal with the past like these stories it sounds like you really have to understand the history as well as the location because you you write these in the uk for mm-hmm. you know happening in the uk and so when we when we talk that way uh, it's kind of curious of why you as an American want to write a, a series in the setting of, of England, as well as um, how much work must it take to make sure that all the details are correct? Well, if, if you knew me, you wouldn't think it was so strange because I am an Anglophile, um, always have been. I think it started with my Scottish grandparents who came over as adults actually to work for some of the wealthy families in the U.S., um, the Rockefellers, for example, that's where my gr- grandmother worked for, they like Scottish people to work for them. Um, my grandfather came over to be a gardener. And um, so they came over as adults, and they, they kind of left Scotland, but Scotland never left them. They lived in Buffalo, New York, in a Scottish community, and it was almost like a little island of Scotland in the middle of the U.S., so... You know, their their language never changed. They they never lost their accents. They they ate food that they had eaten at home. They, you know, every time my parents and I went to visit, we had to go to Canada to go shopping because everything <laughs> British was the best. So I kind of gr- grew up with that. Um, then I, I actually went to, um, for a time, t- to Oxford University in college and just fell in love with it. And um, and since then, because I'm such an Anglophile, I have just immersed myself in British television, um, which is wonderful, um, British books. Uh, when, when I was in junior high, I discovered um, P.G. Woodhouse. I, I'd never heard anything so clever, so funny in my life. Nobody that I knew talked like that. And I just loved it. And then I started reading the golden age mystery writers. And, and this was, you know, I was very young. So I started reading Agatha Christie, of course, which most people start with, Nagio Marsh, Dorothy Sayers, Cyril Hare, G.K. Chesterton. So I, I have been immersed in that. And then for the past, oh, well, 25 years, my husband and I actually travel to the UK at least once a year. In fact, we just got back. 
we were we, we kind of slipped in that little window <laughs> when when you could still go. Now now I think they've tightened things up again. But um, so we were there the end of October, early November. Yeah, it's you know when you write a series based in another country. You know, you can't just make it up. You you have to go. And when I go, I, I feel like I'm topping up my, you know, my Britishness, um, listening to how people speak, looking at the way they dress, um, getting an idea of what the geography looks like, um, eating the food, just all of the sensory experiences that you have in, in travel. And that has helped me. And then... I have actually developed, um, especially during COVID, I've developed a lot of sources in the UK. So I have a detective inspector in the Suffolk Constabulary who answers questions for me. I have a, a priest in Long Melford. I have um, um, a lawyer from London. I have somebody in the coroner's office. I have a couple of museum curators, just people that have been willing, very generously willing to answer questions when I don't know something. And then I always think, okay, well, my main character is American, so if she gets something wrong, I'll just chalk it up to her being an American. <laughs> Americans don't get things wrong. No. <laughs> oh, they do. <laughs> They're always right. What are you talking about? Jeez. No, it's it's one of my favorite. I love watching ITV and BBC and all that. We we have that where we are yeah. and have been living the last couple of years. So it's uh, it's quite entertaining. I I love uh, British stuff myself. Um, do you, what do you have? Um, I or how should I say this? Um, so if someone picks up one of your books, they take it home and read it, and at the end of it, what is it you hope they take away from your book? You know, I think, um. Just about all crime fiction it is about revealing truth. There's restoration of justice. So I want my books to have a satisfying ending. You know, if you're you're musical, I, you know, maybe you've had the experience of you know you're you're in the car listening to a piece of music. It's coming to the end of it, and you can't leave the car until it comes to the end of that musical expression. You know, because it just, you, you can't have it hanging in the air. So when people come to the end of my book, I, I want them to be entertained. I, I want them to be surprised, um, not shocked maybe, but to say, you know, oh, my goodness, I never, I, I never saw that coming. But then I want them to think right after that, oh, but yes, now, now I see. I can look back and see how she planted the clues and, and I should have understood more than I did. But I also want them to come away with a sense of, of a completion of a story, that justice was restored, that the world is back in its normal shape. And then I want them to look ahead a little bit. So what, what I usually do is, is I end with a little bit of an open-ended um, piece that could lead into the next book. Oh, cliffhanger. <laughs> well, yeah, not not exactly, but just you know, yeah. close to that idea. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so now, and, and another aspect of this, okay, of course, of course Tom Mallory is a uh, detective inspector, but Kate Hamilton isn't. So that's kind of a way you've kind of added the uh, amateur sleuth with the detective, and is that something? that you're curious about yourself? Or are you kind of an amateur sleuth yourself? <laughs> you know, uh, I, I actually am. Um, my, uh, in my Scottish um, side of my family, that was my father's parents, um, there were a lot of mysteries, um, things that were not said and things that were not revealed. And so I have actually discovered a lot of them. Um, I discovered, for example, that my grandfather was not my grandfather. Um, my real grandfather was Irish, and um, they separated when my father was eight. And she met my Scottish grandfather. Um, they actually lived together for many, many years because my her real husband was still living. And after he died, which was... Um, 
many years after that, they they were coming to visit us in Illinois. I was living in Illinois at the time with my parents. And they actually got married in Crown Point, Indiana, on the way, which was the only county in Indiana where you could apply for your um, marriage license and actually get married on the same day. Um, Kate has said on a number of occasions, I, I hate mysteries. I can't abide mysteries, but in the book I'm writing right now, I say that that's not really true. Kate loves mysteries. What she doesn't love is not knowing. And that's kind of the way that I have always been, too. I, I want to know. I, I want information. And if, I, if something doesn't make sense or I can't come to the bottom of it, I will try very hard to, to get to the truth. My grandmother would be appalled at all the things that I know about her now. For example, every time the census taker came around, every 10 years, she would shave a couple of years off her life. Oh. And, <laughs> and, and back then, you could do that. You could, you could say you were any age you wanted to. You could say your name was anything you wanted to. You could make up your um, history because things weren't online. Things weren't documented on, on computers. Today we can't do that, and actually there's a lot of information on the computer today that we can go back and try to find find the truth, find secrets. So, yeah, uncovering secrets is what I love in my real life, and that's what I write about too. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, there's so much information available. It's just finding the right information. Yes. That's the hard stuff nowadays because it's inundated with a lot of, um, BS. <laughs> yeah. You know, unfortunately. Um, well, that's amazing. So how do you, um, how do you like to interact with your readers? Do you do um, a website or do you have a, a I, social media and kind of what, what's your favorite way? Um, I, I do have a website. It's um, www.conieberry.com and I um, try to keep it up to date. I, I actually have a monthly newsletter and, and I really enjoy that. I, it, it goes out to, I can't remember how many people um, now, but, but quite a few. And I love hearing back from readers. I, I love when readers contact me and tell me either pointing out something I got wrong or hopefully telling me that they really, really love the story. Um, I, I like going to fan conferences like Malice Domestic where you re meet readers who love mystery fiction. Um, and it, and I actually love doing author events as well. Of course, we've been doing just about all of them on Zoom these days, but um, but now we're starting yeah. to, to do some in person as well. And I love that because the people who come are there because they want to know. They, they want to know what you're writing, why you're writing it, your process of writing. Um, and they're usually a pretty informed group. So it's it's very fun. Well, of course, we'll ha have that linked up with our website and everything so people can find you if they do. You, does it bother you when people give you bad reviews? Um, of course. <laughs> I I've heard a lot of authors say, um, oh, I don't read my reviews, but I don't actually believe that. Um, I don't think that you can avoid reading them. I I got one really, really bad review. Um, and, you know, it, it's funny because of all the good reviews I've gotten, the, the bad review is the one that's stuck in my head. You know, I, ju I just can't get, get over it. So, um, yeah, writers are people. And I think that, um, you know, reviewers should be very honest about things. But sometimes, and, and fortunately, I've not experienced this personally, but I know friends who have where, um, people will really say pretty awful things and <laughs> not really realizing that, that these are human beings that, that they put their heart and soul into this book. And, you know, maybe it's not the next bestseller or, you know, classic, but, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Pe well, people, yeah. Yeah, people are mean nowadays. There's a lot of meanness out there. I always track them down and, and have them terminated, you know, personally. Oh, okay. You know, I, I, I enjoy doing it. I, and then I write a book about 
<laughs> yes, well, you could you could put them in your next book. Kill yeah, off. exactly. I've got a whole lineup of them. I'm busy. Ah. I got a lot of murders going on here. Okay. A lot of torture. Uh, listen, so I was just wondering, are you are your process? Are you able to just sit down and turn it on then? Like, have you got that um, ability to go? Okay, well, tonight between six and eight, there's nobody here, and I've got time, and you can just sit down and then write. Or do you have to be in a particular mood, or does it have to fit you? No, I think I'm I'm somewhere in in the middle. Um, I I wish I were more disciplined. I I should be, but I'm not. So I do try to write every day, um, and it's very difficult, as I said, to put words on a blank page and so my process what I usually do is when I begin every day's writing session I begin with what I wrote the previous day at least a scene and I revise that which which I love doing oh I just love that but then because I've gotten myself back into the story I can make myself push on and push forward um I I know where I'm going i I'm not exactly a plotter. I, I plot out the major events. Sometimes that changes, but I don't always know how I'm going to get from point A to point B. Right. You don't have an outline, so you don't, you don't sit there and kind of go, well, this is how it's going to end, and then write, or, or do you just kind of go with it and find out how it ends yourself? No, I, I usually know how it's going to end, although I'm always open to things changing and they often do, not not necessarily who did it, um, but a lot of things in, in the middle can change. And, and sometimes things unexpected happen. I know I, I've heard other writers talk about this before, but when I was writing uh, the book before this, uh, A Legacy of Murder, I was, uh, Kate was talking to someone about a person who was suspected of committing a murder. This person she was talking to had known the suspected murderer when they were young and uh the guy she's interviewing says well i i know he didn't do it um uh, you know i'm i'm positive and kate and so I'm, I'm i'm just typing this i'm typing along and kate says how can you be so sure i type that and then i i find myself typing the words because he's dead really he is <laughs> and and then I realized that, no, that actually is really good. But then I had to go back and change things in the beginning. So I I love the moments when I'm surprised and things happen that I haven't been anticipating. It doesn't happen every, every time I write, obviously. But when it does, it's usually exactly the right thing. Well, have you ever noticed anything like, uh, I, I know when I write sometimes, it, it's almost like being in like a daydream where – like the weather changes or the time changes. It's it's it, it was uh, just a minute ago. It was like uh, nine a.m. and now it's midnight. Do you have anything like that that happens, or uh, do you usually are you able to keep um, kind of the the, the same um, uh, time and 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 uh, place? Uh, well, I think that sounds like a writing. lot of fun. I I would love to have that experience, <laughs> but but I haven't. I think the closest I've ever come to it are when. Um, times when I have just made up my mind that I'm just going to write, almost like free writing. Do you, do you know that term where you just, mm. you know, you just let your brain kind of go and, and you're free writing. And that's a good way to get a whole lot of words on the page. Now, the words might not always be great, but at least you've got words on the page. And when I've done that, mm. where I kind of let my instinct or my, um, my creative side take over um that's kind of when these unexpected things tend to happen and so i probably should do that more often usually when i'm writing a scene i i write down for myself um, who's in the scene where it is what needs to happen and any kind of undercurrents or things that i need to add in and and, and then i just write and then i have to go back and change change things to make it better I'd, I'd, I'd love to write that like that but of course it probably won't happen but uh, <laughs> that, that, <laughs> they, now the, the COVID thing so over the last couple of years like all this crazy stuff and the weird stuff going on and you know the tension the stress all that stuff yeah. do, do you find that it affects your ability to write and if you can still write 
Um, do you think it kind of makes you write a little darker or maybe you're a little bit more on edge when you write because of the stress? You know, I think that's a really interesting question, Alan. Um, right before COVID hit, I had said to my husband, Ugh, I just wish the world would just stop. <laughs> and, you know, because I was so busy and I wasn't getting enough time to write, and then it did. The world basically <laughs> came to a screeching halt, and I am home. There's no reason I can't write. I, I should have gotten a lot done, but I honestly think that now looking back on it, I think that COVID um, hit us in ways that we are yet really to understand. And I've heard a lot of authors say, and I agree with them, that, that it was actually hard. You know, I didn't have anywhere to go. I wasn't having appointments. I wasn't, you know, I was getting out to the grocery store every once in a while, but, you know, I was just home. And so I should have written like five novels during that time or something, but I really had a hard time getting um, the one that's coming out in, in May finished. I just had to push myself. And one of the things that I like to incorporate in my book is is a little bit of humor, not not ha-ha humor, but kind of a witty, witty kind of a dry humor. Kate, Kate is, can be a little snarky, and, and she's got um, – a little bit of that humor about her, and I found it difficult to keep that attitude. And and actually, what I did to do it was I went back and I would listen on times like getting dressed or cooking or something, and I would put on some um, audible books of British authors that I that have a great sense of humor, and I would listen to that. That would kind of get me back in the right mood. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I had both. I asked that question a lot, and I have people. We you know we get people that say that they were couldn't write properly. They were shut down. Their creativity was slow. Then we had people that say no, they totally escape in their writing, and they can totally get out of this world, and it doesn't seem to 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 bother them. I I just wonder, but in in, in any case, you know, when we go ahead twenty years from now and we look back, I wonder if we'll see or pick up things uh, from what was going on around us, you know, like people that were writing during the war or during different events. Sometimes, you know, it does, it, it's not obvious up front, but later on um, you can sort of pick it up. Yeah, I think you're right, and it's, it's a little bit like the fog of war. You know, while you're in the middle of the battle, you, you can't really see anything around you, and it's only later that you can look back. And so, yeah, I, I do think, I don't know if it'll take 20 years, but, but I, but I do believe very strongly that um, we are going to be able to look back on this period of time and see things that we are not aware of right now. Oh, totally. I mean, you know, I think that the, uh, well, look at, you know, the, 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 the guys that came back from world war two and they had uh, mm -hmm. and how they interacted with their boys, their, their sons. Yeah. And look at all the serial murders in the 60s and 70s. Um, <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I say that because we had that professor on that talked about that, that oh. talked about how the, the surge of serial killers came from and how the interaction between um, the father from the war and their son was. Oh, and, wow. That, that is a completely new thought for me. That's really an interesting thought. Yeah, Peter Vronsky. You read some of his stuff and, and talk to him. He's very interesting about that. He's not all salacious he just kind of talks about numbers and details and how and what you see coming out of the the different time periods and all of a sudden mm. what happens and who knows i mean of course it's all just theory but it's it's interesting because i wonder if we're you know what we're creating out of all this stuff now with the children and yeah, how I, they're going to be yeah. in 20 years that's sort of why i picked 20 years you know, yeah but uh, yeah. you know you're right well, so um so and we have you to blame uh, you <laughs> you wanted the world to stop, and yeah, here we I go. Did. I mean, well, you should be ashamed. Yeah, um, <laughs> anyway, well, it's certainly been a very very good conversation. I've enjoyed having you on, and uh, yeah, it's and, been fun, uh, fascinating. And now, so the book we're talking about is Art of Betrayal, and it's a Kate Hamilton mystery. Yeah, put, at our, put a yeah. V in front of it. The Art of Betrayal. Oh, the art. And and they're the actually. 
Yeah, the art of betrayal. See, she's an English teacher. Yeah, and <laughs> get it right out. <laughs> Sorry about that. And <laughs> there, uh, I, I found out later there's another book with that same title, and it's about I think spies during World War II or something. But that's been out for quite a long time. So. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll just get that. We'll we'll complain about it. Have it taken down. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been interesting. So um, our guest today, Connie Berry. So thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you very much, Alan. I enjoyed it. Thanks, Connie. Tired of wasting time trying to decide what to watch on your streaming service? Go to our website and look for the Martino Movie Reviews. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you! If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Wave Media.